Good evening and welcome. I'm Justine Kane, the Group CEO for Diabetes Australia. I'd like to welcome all of you to our third debate in our great debate series this National Diabetes Week. Before I get into things, I just want to let the 600 odd people online know that we will be finished before State of Origin. <laughs> Depends which state you're from. <laughs> this week, Diabetes Australia has launched Australia's biggest conversation about the impact of diabetes in Australia. We're talking about diabetes prevention, diabetes discrimination, diabetes stigma, busting the myths that surround diabetes and having the bold conversations in a respectful, transparent and holistic manner. Tonight, we're going to be discussing the diabetes epidemic. What can we do to better support people? And what can we do to reduce the impacts on our health system? Before we launch into the debate, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to welcome very warmly my co-host, co -host, Dr Norman Swan, AM, producer and presenter of Radio National's Health Report and a multi-award winning producer and broadcaster. To the panel, be ready. He asked some very good questions last night that really got the conversation going. I'd also like to welcome Yvonne Appleby, a Diabetes Australia ambassador who lives with type 2 diabetes. Just want to raise your hand for the people online. Thanks. I'd like to welcome Associate Professor Sof Andrikopoulos, CEO of the Australian Diabetes Society, Dr Alan Barclay, an accredited practising dietitian and nutritionist with nearly 30 years of experience in clinical dietetics, public health and academia. Dr Catherine Williams, endocrinologist, senior lecturer and senior lecturer at the University of Sydney. Professor Grant Brinkworth, senior principal research scientist with the CSIRO and author of the CSIRO low-carb diet book series. And associate professor Michael Talbot, a specialist in bariatric surgery at St George Private Hospital. I'd also like to welcome our distinguished guests uh, in the room, including the chair of the Australian Diabetes Educators Association, uh, and I know that we have a number, sorry, Amanda Bartlett, and a number of our uh, board directors who are online tonight amongst the 600 people we have, which is fantastic. So to begin, for years we've been advised to eat better food, eat a bit less food, change what you're eating, exercise more, get that stronger willpower, and then you won't have a weight problem. But 66% of all Australians are currently overweight or obese. That puts them at a much higher risk of developing many chronic conditions, including type 2 diabetes. Are two thirds of Australians really lacking the willpower? Or is this a physiology of obesity that we, is very complex that we need to understand much, much better? And are we possibly living in an environment that is fueling the obesity crisis? What are the interventions that work and what doesn't? Are there medicines that are a magic pill? Is there a simple solution? Those are the questions we want to explore tonight. To get the conversation started, I said to uh, Dr Norman Swan, I was going to ask him the first question. So Norman. And I don't know what it is, by the way. I'm putting you on the spot. Why are the majority of Australians losing the battle to stay health in a healthy weight range? And what can we do to change the tide? Um, I'm not sure we fully know, but if you look at our co cohort studies, in other words, if you look at people born in certain you know, 10 year groups, um, for every 10 years, probably since the 1960s, they are progressively heavier. And children are progressively heavier, and it's gone through to adulthood. And not, so they're heavier each generation, not generation, even each half generation. So parents are the same. Children are the same. We haven't had some genetic, you know, there's not been some genetic engineering of children. This is an environmental problem, just beginning and end. That's it. Um, they, we've always had people who've been overweight. 
Um, but the burden of it has to be environmental. Have the genes changed? No. Have parents changed? Are parents somehow less um, you know, attentive to their children? Do they love their children less? No. Do we have less willpower? No. It's environmental. So um, that's my, what my view is. We'll see what the panel agrees or not. Thank you. I'll hand over to you to talk with the panel. Well, I'll start off. I mean, you're, you might be running the Diabetes Society soft, but you've got a background as a basic researcher. Um, do we actually know why obesity increases type 2 diabetes? Uh, we probably do. Uh, we know that obesity is associated with uh, insulin resistance and the stress that the insulin resistance puts on the beta cell to secrete insulin reveals the underlying defect, you get impairment secretion, and then you get hyperglycemia, diabetes. So we do know the sort of consequences of obesity on, um, on, on causing type 2 diabetes or, or, or precipitating, I shouldn't say causing, precipitating type 2 diabetes. And that's why if you lose weight and you can sustain weight, whichever way that is, we can talk about that with a panel, whichever way you do it, if you can sustain it, then you can put diabetes, type 2 diabetes, into remission. Okay. Yvonne, as the one consumer on the panel, what annoys you most about this debate or this discussion, public discussion, conversation about obesity and diabetes? I think that a lot of people might feel that um, it's a person's own fault that they have developed type 2 diabetes. Um, as Justine was saying, uh, that you haven't got enough willpower, you might be too lazy, you're not eating the right things, you're not moving enough. Um, basically, a, a lot of it I feel um, people with diabetes can sometimes feel shame that it's something that they've done to cause uh, this illness. I mean, it is political. I remember I ran an obesity summit for Peter Beatty, the Queensland government, a few years ago. And it was all going swimmingly when we were talking about obesity as a disease. But when somebody stood up and gave the statistic that people who live in cul-de-sac designed suburbs are six kilos heavier on average than people who lived in mixed suburbs, correcting for social class and education, the obesity summit was over because the housing minister was in the room. <laughs> To what extent, Grant, is this a political issue? Oh, look, I think political plays part of it. I mean, like we, we talked about... I mean, about to explain that story, it's that if you live in a, in a, in a Scottish suburb, you've got to go in the car everywhere. You can't walk... That's right. Shop. And there's research that suggests that people, you know, that live in a grid pattern are more likely to um, use walking as a or a bike as a modality to get to where they want to, then you know, I think there's a threshold. You know, if you have to walk, I don't know the threshold, but if there's a certain threshold that they've shown and people in living cul-de-sacs will not, you know, it's beyond that threshold. And so they'll use the car and other, um, you know, non-physical activity ways of working and uh, um, getting to where they need to be. But I think, you know, there are political forces to this. You know, you look at, you know, we talked about environment. Our environment's not just about the physical environment, that in, in, we've engineered activity out of our environment. You know, there's also around the food industry. You know, that that's a very political discussion around that we need economies, we need healthy economies, and the food industry is a part of that. And it, others would argue that the food industry is actually promoting the high intake of high energy um, low nutrient dense um, foods. And so that's actually part of it. So I think, but I mean, like with all of that saying, I think that we have to find a solution that we can look within the system of how we can engineer obesity. And uh, you mentioned environment, but there's other factors. There's other socioeconomic issues that, you know, that, that help to increase the risk of obesity and chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes. There's, you know, cultural factors, which is big in, in Australia. We have such a multicultural um, society. There's um, There are genetic factors at play. And what's really scary to me, Norman, is that you, you say that genetics hasn't changed, but there's so much 
evidence now around the epigenetics. And, and unfortunately, I think with the obesity epidemic that we've seen in the last 20, 30 years, that we are programming the next generation to be obese. So we have to work within the economic and the political forces to find solutions um, to this issue that we need to address today. Alan, do you think we're measuring it in the right way? No, um, I think we've become obsessed with the body mass index since the late 60s, which, of course, is the um, mathematical equivalent of Leo, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. It was the ideal uh, from Europe. In fact, it was uh, male, French and Scottish um, people in the 18th. I'm glad we got it right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm from the UK too. <laughs> but but so, you know, it doesn't measure central adiposity, which I think is what um, Soph was in fact getting at. It, it's not how much weight you carry, because if you're a bodybuilder or an athlete, you can be, you know, overweight or a beast. We're talking about the state of, or, state of origin, their BMIs yes, exactly. are all going to be over 30. And, and it gets back to what um, Grant was saying, the population has changed. I'm one of the 10 pound poms, as you may well be as well. Um, and, and it was mostly people from Western Europe. Seems to be a lot more than that. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and so people that I grew up with were, were from that um, background. But, you know, I came to New South Wales about 30 odd years ago, and there's a lot of Pacific Islanders here. And, you know, I'm considered to be fairly skinny, but but in Perth in my day, I wasn't. You know, so so the genetics have changed. We've, we've Change the migrants. They're coming from the Middle East. They're coming from the Pacific Islands. Uh, and they well, hold on a second. The genetics haven't changed. Well, it's just that we don't under, we don't understand. We haven't understood well enough the different risk levels of different ethnic groups. Yes. If you're from South Asia, your BM a normal BMI is what 22 rather than 25. If you're going to talk about BMI and yeah. waist circumference is. Uh, well, I would prefer and, and clinically I use waist height ratio because you know Asian people are fairly short compared to say you know, Dutch. Uh, so so it's proportional to the height. And I think that's quite important. Waist circumference is important. Obviously, it's in the OSD risk tool. We don't have BMI in the OSD risk tool. We have waist circumference. But I think waist height ratio is actually a better tool and is what I use clinically. And I think we should be looking at that as a better indicator of population risk with respect to diabetes than BMI. I think BMI is too crude a tool. Catherine, are we letting politicians off the hook by calling this a disease? I mean, it's very, it's very ideologically sound to call obesity a disease. I actually think that's not letting them off the hook because uh, if we call it a disease, we're obligated to do something about it. Um, so in the people I treat have a disease and um, morally I can't sit there and let our politicians get away with um, not providing treatments for the people that I see. Um, but I think it is an incredibly complex issue because we do have all these, and I think now social determinants of health, and we've talked about this, but it's not just access to fresh food. It's actually food security, insecurity, housing insecurity, social isolation, all these things are playing into developing people developing severe obesity and very complex illnesses. It's not just risk of obesity, it's actually an acceleration factor to very severe obesity where there's multi-diseases in one person and frailty and disability, frankly, and death. So you get to a certain point, like heart disease, you could all call it the heart disease environmental as well, but you get to a certain point where you've got the heart disease. I'm seeing 20-year-olds with who can walk five metres from heart failure due to obesity. And I can't sit on that. Yeah. And the the interesting part is that there is not one medication that's PBS subsidized right. for a disease that causes that morbidity. Well, I might add that there's also very little Medicare support. You know, you get five allied health visits in a year to all the whole allied health team to deal with a chronic condition. It's really quite scary. Well, we'll get to the you know the drug bit in a minute because that's what I've been holding off that. That could have been my first question, Michael, <laughs> but it's not going to be because because drugs are never the total answer. Although they may be, there may be a revolution going on. But Michael, just give us an update on because, uh, but just for my benefit, really, what's the current standard of care with bariatric surgery? Is it sleeve? Is it, what, what, what's what's what, what can you expect from bariatric surgery? Individualised care, depending on the person's circumstances. Um, and often multimodal care. So we are very aggressive users of off-label medications as well in order to optimise patients and give them opportunities for weight loss sometimes outside of surgery. Such as? Or we use... Um, 
So, so you use the semaglutides in the GLP-1? I'll, I'll be allowed to say that. Yes, you are. Without the TGA. Well, there's, there's a policeman outside. Yeah. Waiting for that. Um, you won't be the only person in this room using it off-label. The most frequently performed operation we undertake is called a sleeve gastrectomy. It provides an average of about a third of your total body weight lost. So most people will lose about 30% of their starting weight. Uh, now there is always- Does that depend on your starting weight? In other words, the higher your weight, the more you lose or? It's very foggy, but it seems to, the lower your weight, the less you will lose. So once you get under about a hundred kilograms, 105, the percentage probably drops, but it seems to be relatively solid number. However, we don't operate on that many people over 180, 190, those number of people are relatively small. But it's about 30% for a sleeve, and a sleeve is 80% of Australian surgery, 20% of Australian surgery of bypass surgeries, which is 35 to 40% of your starting weight. But more complications. More complications, but more metabolic effect. So if you've got a greater metabolic disease, then the therapy might be justified because the metabolic side effects are easy to treat, whereas the metabolic side effects of obesity are very hard to treat. And the, the procedures do have um, weight maintenance despite a degree of weight regain. So the average weight loss at 10 years after a sleeve is about 20% from your original starting weight. And a percentage of people get retreatment around about five percent probably get retreatment so with that extreme weight loss which is bigger than the medications are claiming at least there are new medications coming out which claim to be coming close but come back to that um what metabolic effects i mean are you curing type two cure is the wrong word you do get remission in about um 70 percent of people if you look at people 15 years after surgery the remission rate drops to about a third of what you'll often find for... So they um, relapse. They relapse. But you'll often find that their medication dose is a lot less. So you might get them on insulin, operate on them, they stop all their meds, but they're still a diabetic in remission, and you might see five, six, seven, eight years later they're on a tablet. But a third remain remission at fifty remain in remission at 15 years. I mean, this is the topic of tomorrow night's uh, session in Adelaide, which we'll come back to, it will come back to tomorrow night. Uh, and just finally, I mean, you obviously join the conversation. What's the cost and to what extent it's covered in Australia given, and what's the health, what are the health economics of bariatric surgery? So the health economics are that it pays for itself in a diabetic, if done in the public hospital within two years, um, public or private, the total cost, uh, regardless of who's paying for it, be it the health fund with a co-payment or the hospital, is some for the, the public government um, funded hospitals, is somewhere between 16 and 21,000 as a median regardless of the system. So if you have it done privately, you're bearing most of the cost if it's done in the public hospital, which only about 2% of Australian cases are, the taxpayer covers it. But that that amount of money is very similar to what you'd pay for a gallbladder removal or a hysterectomy or something like that. It's not a large amount of money, especially in people who are often health consumers, they're in hospital having other things done. If you can treat them and get their diseases in remission, you offer them a period of time outside the hospital system. Well, Yvonne, this is an important consumer issue, this lack yes. of access through lack of affordability. It is, of course. Um, I think generally with the Azempic, it's about $130 uh, per pen. But I'm very lucky because I've got a whole lot of comorbidities. I've got severe chronic asthma. I've also got arthritis and I've got glaucoma and high blood pressure. I'm very fortunate that I'm able to have a concession card. So my medicines are a lot cheaper than they would be for the general public. And for that, I'm very grateful. I mean, these... 
GLPs will become available yeah. legally for um, for obesity. But I'm talking about there will always be a role for bariatric surgery. That this is not, you know, you've got public waiting lists that are as long as your arm. Mm -hmm. Some states do very, very little. Um, and in the private sector, it's not properly reimbursed. I mean, th th this uh, that's what I was really referring to as a consumer issue. Yes, I think it's just as much an issue um, that should be treated appropriately, as the professor was saying. Um, you know, rather than, you know, prevention is better than cure, so to speak, that if we can use bariatric surgery as an effective treatment, then that, that will uh, solve a whole lot of issues down the track for the patient, um, as well as um, the cost for the government. And their healthcare systems, which are currently being filled up with people being treated with palliative intent because they cannot ex access the care that they need. And so they're in and out of hospital all the time, slowly going down a sinkhole rather than being with effective care. I am going to come back to prevention and environmental change. I just know that I'm on to this treatment side. Let's just get, get into the weeds a little bit. So, Catherine, project forward a year or two. We've got semaglutide on the, uh, approved on the PBS, so Yvonne doesn't have this problem anymore. It's, it's properly subsidised. You've got the new ones coming through, which are claimed to be even more effective than this. Um, how? Just talk to me about obesity treatment in two years' time. What's the role of the medical treatment versus surgery? And I'll get Michael to comment on that as well. Just give us a sense of looking forward. Because last night I had somebody on the panel who thought it's all over, Red Rover. You know, this is an experienced researcher thinking this is revolutionary. This is the statin for obesity and and so on. You know, there's still plenty of cardiac surgery that goes on with statins. Uh, well, these tools are incredible because uh, there's there's four or five coming through the pipeline and some of them, you know, 25% weight loss at four years still going down. So they're very, very effective for weight management. But I think this is where we've got to realise that obesity management is not actually weight management. Weight management is part of it, but we need to look at that whole person. So what do you mean um, by that? So um, the first thing I do is talk to the person about their health. I don't even look at their weight. Um, and I find out what's going on with their health and what their risks for future health problems are as well. And then I find out about what their you know, mental health is, what their psychosocial state is and what their weight trajectory has been through their life and what experiences they've had and what their beliefs are and what they want from coming to see me. And then I look at their weight and, and we work on goals together. So um, there's a whole lot going on in that person. I'm talking about severe obesity here because that's what I see in Greater Western Sydney, which is a very socioeconomically diverse um, place and people have incredible lives um, that we I would never have comprehended had before I started working there. And you need to start supporting that person to build their life. Again, it's not about just getting the weight down. The weight obviously helps. And, that and what actually, happens if you don't do that, if you just do a prescribe and walk away? Yeah, you're going to end up with nutritionally very unsound people. So this is what I worry about is if we just, it's like the same if you don't prep someone and support someone after surgery, you'll end up with someone who's very nutritionally unsound. Because if they're eating a diet that's a very poor quality and then you take their appetite away um, through various ways, um, they're just going to eat even less um, of a very poor quality diet. So it's all so about... So the diet's crap. You're just yeah. eating a smaller diet that's still crap. It's yeah, and we're going to end up disease. with very frail, unwell individuals down the track. We are actually hoping to prolong disease-free, um, healthy survival in these people in you know full lives, good quality of life. And so you've got to look at the whole picture. You cannot just target the weight. So two or three years from now, who ends up with bariatric surgery, Michael? Whoever needs it. And um, then well, that's my question. Who, will, who, who do you think will need it? Um, there will be people who do not respond effectively to medications. We don't know how long they're all going to last for. And there's some people, because all of our therapies have a response rate that's on a bell curve of distribution. So somebody who doesn't respond well to a GLP-1 agonist might still respond to other therapies. And surgery and medicines can work as complementary therapies for people with more complex disease. So at the moment, um, we're only treating such a tiny percentage of people with severe obesity. If we start increasing 
the number we treat, then we will find some of those people who do not respond to the new first line agents and still consider surgery as a second line line agent. Yeah. Norman, if you think of someone who's 250 kilos and they lose 10% of their body weight and they've got all these medical complications, that's not good enough. You then, you know, you, you're using that medication to prep them for surgery and then you're supporting them post-surgery with the medication as well as a whole heap of other interventions. So they're very complementary and very important. So the message is it's not as simple as you think. Well, I don't think it's as simple as like we all acknowledge, I think, that surgery and, and pharmaceutical drugs definitely have a role and, and they're, they're effective, but they're not really going to be the, the wide scale solution that everyone's looking for. And there are risks, there are costs, there, there's side effects with with these types of approaches. And I know Alan and I sort of come from that sort of background, but you know we have to still remember that in all of our public health guidelines, you know, lifestyle, diet and exercise is still our first line treatment. And the, the reason why people go, oh, well, that so doesn't work. So my question work. is, yeah. does, it, does it work? Yeah, that doesn't work. And then I, and I think I think we've got plenty of big, we've got big, big studies to show it can work and it can work really well. But the reason why it doesn't work in translation, you know, we've got the diabetes prevention trial that showed that you can actually reduce the risk of people getting diabetes that um, were, had pre-diabetes better than you can with some of the previous drugs like metformin. Um, so it can work and it can work really well. We've got evidence that shows that um, lifestyle approaches can achieve diabetes remission is what we can achieve with, you know, drugs and, 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 and surgery. And even our national statement has shown that we have to look at more intensive dietary therapies like very low calorie diets, lower carbohydrate diets that have shown that we can achieve remission. I think where it all falls down, and this is where I get pretty passionate, is that we know that one of the success factors for achieving behaviour change and gr and great sustained substantial long-term weight loss is really professional support. And that's what we really don't have. Um, we don't have enough funding to help professional support. So then if we can't have the funding for support, professional support. So this is exercise physiology, nutritionists. Dietitians, um, behavioural interventionalists, um, psychologists, um, diabetes educators. Endocrinologists. And yeah, yeah, endocrinologists. Um, wash, and, and, wash your and, mouth out. What, really? And if we don't, if we do, so if we're not going to fund that, I mean, like the other area that we need to start looking at is is also, you know, how do we use and capitalise digital health as a way of AI and technology to try and mimic some of this so that we can scale this in a, a, a cost-effective way? Uh, Alan, I, from, from my sins, uh, I mean, I'm a kind of proud of it in one sense, but I was the medical host of Biggest Loser for six seasons. Uh, it was one of the most amusing and interesting things I've ever done on, on television. Um, and the, uh, but what was interesting was one of the things we used to do was actually show people common vegetables and ask them to name them. <laughs> and it was remarkable the extent to which they couldn't. So, so, you, so you're all going on about the Mediterranean diet, more vegetables, less red meat, blah, blah, blah. But food literacy is appalling. I, I, yeah, what's going on there? Well, uh, I've been around a bit. Uh, up until I believe... Well, if you were a 10 by pom, you have been, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Up until the mid-'80s, I think home economics was a mandatory component of high school education, and then I think it became voluntary in the mid to late-'80s. So I think people have lost the ability to... Well, girls got home economics, boys got woodwork. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes, but then... Okay, you expected to marry <laughs> if you're a bloke, a nice woman that she'd look after you, right? I'm going back 50 years here. So just be okay. careful, we're in a very <laughs> different world. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> so yes, that was the way things were. People had the skills to identify healthy foods, they could go shopping, they could prepare basic dishes. I think we've lost food literacy. We talked so, about health yeah, literacy. Let's do a reality check on that. The if you look at at the Amish, you know the Amish. The, yes. the, these are the people who live in um, northeastern yes. northern America. North America. They live a 16th century lifestyle. Their diet is this. So our our diet has less fat in it than the diet of our grandparents. Objectively, it actually is healthier. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Amish, they're eating thousands of calories a day, 
and it's full of saturated fat, high carb. They've got low rates of diabetes, low rates, relatively low rates of coronary heart disease because they're living a pre-industrial lifestyle. They're very active. So the question is, the, do we need a new food literacy for the diabetes, the obesogenic yeah. environment that we're living in? Uh, look, I, I think there's certainly something to it. The other thing that's changed in my lifetime, I used to walk to school or ride my bicycle. We would play before school. We would play after school. We'd play soccer at morning tea and lunchtime. Uh, now my kids, who are in their 20s, spend most of their time on the computer, on their phones, on their iPad. I think we've engineered physical activity out of our lives over the past probably 40 years. So, so it's not just the food supply that's changed, the environment's changed. The aim is, I imagine, I've seen the Harrison Ford movie. You know, the, no, the, the, the wood chippies, you know, they, 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 they burn 5,000 calories a day. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, you know, we could eat those foods. I think you're right. I think we do eat slightly less kilojoules, and I think the food supply has improved in my lifetime. But because we're so inactive, uh, we need to probably go a little bit further. It has to be more uh, nutrient dense, less energy dense uh, to accommodate. But I think, you know, there's a, only so far you can go. You can go down about 4,200 kilojoules, 1,000 calories, right? Beyond that, you're starting to get vitamin and mineral deficiencies and what have you. So Does anybody call Michael Mosley that? <laughs> but then you go to VLED, so very low energy diets, which Grant said, you know, work exceptionally well. Uh, but they're a short-term solution to a long-term problem. Uh, you know, for and you've got to be months, very careful. You, know, you, you can lose 15% as they did in the direct trial in the UK quite easily. You can keep it off. So you can get similar results to the drugs and the surgery. And I'm not saying that and I'm competing with you guys. They're all complementary as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, you know, it's hard to replicate that in a real food environment. It's very difficult. I don't think people have the time or the skills to do that anymore. I'll come to Catherine in a second, but soft... It strikes me, with almost everybody here, there are so many unknowns. What's the research agenda here? Look, for me, I think I'm going to take it back again and 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 talk about... You better say you're not going to answer my question. Genetics. I'll answer the question. I think, I think it's very complex. It, and from the discussion, as you saw, it's, it's mighty complex. And I think we do need to understand the genetics of obesity. All the studies that, that have been done can only explain about, I don't know, 10% of the genetic uh, burden of obesity. We still don't understand the genetics. And then we need to understand the other determinants that we've spoken about uh, here uh, in terms of uh, the socioeconomic impacts, uh, in terms of the various environmental insults and impacts. Remember, it's it's um, it's a genetic predisposition in an environment that allows weight gain to and perhaps it allows weight gain to occur even easier than it occurred pre-COVID, uh, if if I may say so. So so I think and why? Well, because we're less even we're less not going active. Yeah. Even less active because we can work from home. I mean, this this thing about oh, I can work from home. It doesn't really matter. And what do I do when I work from home? I don't know about your kids, but my kids sit there and uh, order Uber, Uber Eats all the time, right? Oh, why should we cook? I'll just get Uber Eats, right? So, 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 so we've allowed the environment to really, really impact your, your body weight. And so I think we need research on all these fronts to be able to then so what, provide proper... So what? So, so my question is, what? What? It sounds great, but what does genetic? How, how far does that actually get you? I mean, for example, there are genes for lung cancer. Yeah, but let, let's talk about smoking-related lung cancer. There are genes for smoking-related lung cancer, and a lot of us are born with those genes, but we'll only ever know we've got the gene if we smoke. But knowing that you've got, well, well, I suppose if you knew that you've got the gene, you could be very careful about it. But nonetheless. Um, is it really a more preventive thing? If you know what the genes are, you do sure. the genetic testing and it's a preventive thing? Not only if, if we knew the genes or the, collect, the collection of genes that causes moderate to... Well, we do know some of the monogenic uh, uh, causes of really severe obesity, right? But we're talking about the more moderate to uh, severe... Well, moderate the commoner to, to sort of, higher... Yeah. To higher obesity, if we knew the collective of those genes, A, 
you could be more careful because you could say, well, I, I need to be more educated uh, in, a, in a diet sense and, and be able to, to distinguish your aubergines and, and your okras and, and your lentils uh, because you were from a Mediterranean background and we're the best. Uh, and also... That was last night's talk. And also, our interventions will be better, right? Why? Because as I said last night, you'd be able to tailor the medications to the underlying cause of disease, and we don't have that yet. I'll ask you a quiz later as who the second longest-lived people in the world are. Just have a think about that, and I'll come back to that later. Catherine, before Alan, you will continue on for some of the things that we've been talking about. And I think we need to start thinking about people having good diets and people increasing their physical activity as outputs and start asking questions as to why those things have changed um, because we're missing the point, you know, educating people about diet. Why are they having poor diets? Um, you know, there's a whole heap of factors and I'm never been more conflicted as a clinician because I'm not sure whether all the money should go on social supports or health system. You know, I want it to go to the health system, obviously, because <laughs> that's where I work, but actually maybe it should should go to improving equity. And this is really coming out, um, you know. In well, equi diet. equity in, in what? I mean, the, the a close correlation. Socioeconomic equity, equity and support of people who are struggling from a social so point support. of view. Um, and also addressing things like social isolation, like feeling loneliness is actually associated with severe disease. And if we don't start looking, and that that is why greater Western Sydney, you know, Western um New South Wales have incredible rates of obesity with complications, and why is that? We need to really start addressing those things. So, um, I think clinicians. So, 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 is the, so is the constant. I mean, the other correlation I was coming to there is the concentration of fast food outlets. If you look yeah. at McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Penrith Chicken, Penrith is a great example of that. We, you know, we're a food desert. You know, the St Mary's, one of the you know highest rates of obesity. You don't actually find a healthy place in our Penrith LGA. There's 16 percent of the food outlets are healthy apparently. It's and, and it's a huge yeah. problem in Aboriginal communities. Yeah. So do you regulate fast food outlets? I'm actually all for the nanny state, yeah, because I don't think that um, the uh, you know commercial organisations get regulated at all. So we are very vulnerable as people. So I think the government should step in, actually. Education primes people for an intervention, but it is not the intervention. Yep. Not the one with impact anyway. No. No, well, there's very little evidence that education works, as, as you've seen. I just wanted to raise another issue that's... Another one? God, <laughs> no, no. You said we could butt in. <laughs> <laughs> Over my lifetime, and it's actually an environmental issue as well, you know, we had things in paper, you know, fish and chips game in the newspaper, your uh, soft drink was in um, glass bottles, uh, everything was in paper bags, not plastic. And it, somewhere around the 80s, we started wrapping everything in plastic. And there's this whole endocrine disruptor theory, which is sort of a it's tacked on at the end of most things. Oh, this is like the third theory. There's the environment, and then there's this. And but those endocrine disruptors do build up in biological systems over time. And this could be one of the factors that I think we're we're sort of not paying enough attention to because all of those foods that you associate with being unhealthy. Are actually wrapped in plastic, or that you know even the water bottles are plastic, and it leaches into the water. So our environment, we're actually swimming in endocrine disruptors, and the foods that we associate as being unhealthy are probably wrapped the most and have the most of these in there. So it's a confounding factor that I think we don't take into account. Luckily, there's a push now to go back to glass and cardboard to take these endocrine disruptors out. There's a whole uh, I believe there's a... a but that's more, more for climate reasons, reasons than environment. Oh, yes, but there could be a nice side effect. But St Mary's will be the last place. Right, that's exactly right. Um, I think you're right, but also ultra-processed foods. There's a lot of research now and how that's actually changing our brain chemistry and how our drive for food and also, um, you know, metabolically is making our... Um, but they're all wrapped in plastic. Yeah, so we're... we're well, that's the thing. So, so you, Yvonne, the where do you sit as a consumer with the regulation, so sugar taxes, fat taxes, uh, regulating, um, you know, going down as far, which you're never going to get a politician to do, but um, regulating fast food outlets, but certainly advertising on television and those sorts of things. Are you for that that intervention to control this epidemic? I am. Um, so I am uh, specifically for the advertising. Um, I know when I was growing up, I'm 58, but we didn't see that many 
that much advertising on TV, although we weren't watching that much TV anyway, as Professor was saying, we were out playing or, or whatever we were doing. We weren't stuck inside watching TV or playing computers. However, I do believe in personal responsibility as well. So whether there is a tax on a product or not, I think it could be up to the individual to decide, um, you know, whether this has got an extra 10% of tax, will I still eat or drink it anyway? So, Grant, if you look internationally, what's working? Because everybody's got this problem. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it is the challenge because everyone draws the tax thing, the analogy to smoking, right? Everyone says, you know, we've taxed the life out of cigarettes. They're so expensive now. I've never purchased a cigarette or smoked one, I'd like to say. But um, they're so expensive now, and it seems to have worked, right? So people go, well, why can't oh, well, we you do know, you know why it's worked is that increasing the price of cigarettes stops kids smoking. Mm. It doesn't stop adults smoking. It stops kids smoking. So the theory is if you increase the price of unhealthy food and leave healthy food well-priced, kids won't eat unhealthy food to that extent, and therefore you won't get the, the disease-causing process which starts in childhood. You totally understand, you know, um, where, you know but Sorry, I think the challenge it. with that analogy is that, um, is that, you know, the effect size of smoking on lung cancer is so strong, right? But when we look at food, it's it's quite modest and it's quite weak. And so it's harder to build that evidence case of why you do that. And then you get to that whole diversity of the food system is then who wins and who loses. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, you know, you can't isolate one particular food to say that that's what's caused. Like, it's like the sugar sweetened beverage argument. Yes, I, I'd probably sit here and argue, argue that that's probably contributed to obesity and, and diabetes. But is it the only thing that's done that? And, you know, that's the challenge, I think. I think the issue is with, with that argument is you can live without smoking. You can live without alcohol if you want to go that far. But you can't live without food. Nutrients. Right? Without food. Mm. Now, then it becomes a choice, right? What is it? So you can't live without food. That's one thing. And the second thing is, I don't think we sort of realise, if we stop for a moment, that food is the one thing that every society on this planet does. Every culture centres around food. What do we do to celebrate something? We get together for a meal. What do we do when we want to, uh, out of sadness, we get around for food? So food is tribal. It brings us together. It makes us feel safe. And it makes us feel like we belong somewhere. Right? So I don't think we can sit and go, oh, well, let's just tax mm. sugar and fat and this and that, and, and, and we'll sort out the problem or part of the problem that way. I think it's a little bit more... Yeah, more more in depth, more complex than that. Yeah. But if the aim is to create diversity of food options in food deserts, it doesn't have to be about something as brutal as that. You could consider creating or having conversations about legislation aiming for the end end point of increased diversity of food choices. And the thing about prevention campaigns isn't about banning things, but finding ways to make the correct choice the easy choice oh. rather than the hard choice, whereas mm -hmm. currently in a lot of places the correct choice isn't actually even on the table. So for one season of Biggest Loser, we went to Ararat in Victoria, which was the second heaviest town in Australia. Brunderburg was the heaviest in those days. And, I mean, this was a showbiz intervention, but the... Companies spent money on walking tracks and so on, galvanised the community, got an average weight loss per capita of 3.5 kilos. Coles and Woolies ran out of fruit and veg because their product pattern was suiting the population, what they demand, and the demand changed dramatically. So it is possible. I have no idea how well that was sustained. Probably not. But the you've got to obviously have something in there that keeps it going, which comes to regulation interventional politicians advertise they don't want to do it. So well, we already have a GST on non-core food. So all of these discretionary foods are actually taxed already. I guess the argument is, is do you up it? 
And I think there's an argument for that. But do you up it on one food, as Grant was getting at, or do you up it on all of them? You know, there's an argument for that too. And it's all these sort of discussions that we need to be having as a community. I, I think it's foolish to focus on sugar-sweetened beverages yeah. because alcohol is the number one source of liquid kilojoules in our diet. It's it's nearly one, two and a half times what you get from soft drinks you get from alcohol. And a lot of people don't drink alcohol because of religious or even because of their age. So, you know, there, there's all these social things that we have to overlay on this. We've got to be much more uh, nuanced than just a big sledgehammer that, you know, just kill that because I, I don't think it will work. I mean, there are sugar sweet and beverage taxes in various parts of the world. At this point in time, there is no evidence that they've actually had any health benefits. Yes, it uh, prompts food reformulation, but there's no evidence of, of any weight so, or other issues. Almost every centenary has got an obesity strategy. I, I think the federal government's got one. National obesity strategy. We do, yes. Why is it failing? It's a, it only came out last year. It That's came out in 2022. <laughs> That's right. It's only just started. And it won't be. Well, there's money in the budget for it, so we've got to give it a chance. <laughs> we'll take your question. The thing is, it's, a, it's a few million. We'll take your enough. questions. There, there is a national obesity strategy. It's more on the preventative side. It needs implementation. And it needs funding to implement yeah. it. I and there's not enough of and that. And you need to help people who've actually got the problem to help them get better. Who's the second longest lived people in the world? So the Japanese are the longest, second longest? Australians. Elderly Greek Australians living in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> you're not elderly for a long yeah, time. Yeah. So. Your mum and dad are, but you're not. Know. Hi, Mum. So, very quickly, the reason you think was the Mediterranean diet. So, the Mediterranean diet is not a unitary diet. It's different in different parts of the Mediterranean. It's the diet of the Greek islands. And most Greek migrants to Australia are from the Greek islands. And it's more than just vegetables and only having meat once a week. It's how you cook. And the Greek Orthodox Church has about 100 fast days a year. But it's not Michael Mosley fasts. It's like vegan. You just don't eat animal protein, so frugality. And if you look at Luigi Fontana's work at the Perkins Institute, he's showing that frugality is better than fasting because you 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 don't get that calorie um, response in the body where you're at a resting metabolic rate. And they grow their own food, so it's fresh. Well, it's, it's at Melbourne, so they've got their own allotment of cooking. You got to cook, and I can stick to the Greek island diet quite well. Thank you all very much indeed. I mean, what I take away from this is the complexity of the story, the fact that we're all hearing about these new um, weight loss drugs, which are dramatic, but we're hearing that they are not, um, you know, to use the cliche, the magic bullet. There is all sorts of stuff that's going on with somebody who is obese and metabolically, socially, economically, and that has to be dealt with. The government has to recognise that and appropriately fund multidisciplinary team-based care, which they don't at the moment through general practice, um, that there will always be a role for bariatric surgery. So Michael will fight to live to fight another day. Thank you very much. And there is still a big research agenda. There's lots of stuff we don't know, but that crosses multidisciplines from molecular biology through to social science. Please join me in thanking our panel. To our panelists, to our audience um, in the room and online, and a big thank you, of course, to Norman for the great wrap up. Uh, I think that it's really clear that there is lots to be done, that there is a passionate and caring community that want to do more and change things and make the world a better place for future generations. I just would like, as everyone leaves, um, I'm sure this is going to generate much conversation. Um, there's some really powerful words that have been used tonight and I'd just actually like to reflect on a couple of things that have been said that you might want to continue conversations. We are slowly, we have individuals who are slowly going us at, down a sinkhole. That is heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. And then we hear the more positive words of we want to prolong disease-free quality of life. Let's make the correct choice the easy choice. So together, let's work on this wicked challenge. Let's not give up and let's continue to do it in a respectful, caring and compassionate way. Thank you.